It's time to get educated on the craziness impacting K-12 classrooms and college campuses around the world. This is The Dr. Duke Show. Hello everyone and welcome to The Dr. Duke Show. We got a great program for you today. So as always, please consider hitting that share button real easy and keep us growing. Today's show is sponsored by Mike Lindell and our friends at MyPillow. You know, he was persecuted by government for simply defending Donald Trump. That's unacceptable, but their loss is your gain. This week, MyPillow is offering 40% off on their slipper collection. That is a nice slipper at a cheap price. Talk about a perfect gift for the holidays. Simply use the Dr. Duke access code. That's D-R-D-U-K-E. Plus, you can save up to 66% on many other items at MyPillow.com. Christmas time is here. Get some slippers. Today we start with a very unsettling but predictable new study that finds only a staggering 18%. 18% of U.S. households contain a nuclear family with kids and a mom and a dad who are married. It is staggering. In fact, um, listen to some of these statistics before I turn it over to Katie to make sense of this. The Census Bureau's count showed that 17.8%, just 17.8% of the United States' 130 million households featured married parents with children under the age of 18. That's only down from 18.6 from the last year, but down much more significantly from over the last 40% in 1970. In 1970, 40% of families had a mom and dad married and children under the age of 18. You are at under 18% now. Uh, there are actually currently just 23.1 million American homes with those nuclear families, the fewest since 19. 1959. And the reason, get this, the reason that experts blame on the drop include the pandemic delaying marriage and a continued birth rate de decline. How about this? How about the real problem here is we have attacked, the progressive left has viciously attacked the nuclear family in the ultimate goal of undoing culture so you can remake it in the form of socialism. The, the nuclear family, the God instituted, the sociological validated nuclear family has been nuked for about 50 years now and the chickens have come home to roost. We do know, and we've known this, and it's across the whole West, we're not having kids at a rate that's actually sustainable to even replace us currently. So if you have a, a mom and a dad, you would need to replace, you need at least two children then. And the rate is basically, I think it might be just right around two, per, it might, it, we might just be there, otherwise we're lower, like 1.7, 1.8 persons per household. So we're not even making it so we can replace each other or one another. And when I read this story, I guess I was like, yeah, it's bad, but not shocking. Like that's where I'm at with all these stories. It's like, yep, it's bad, but not shocking. What's interesting though is that in 1970, we're talking 40%, and it, that much of a decline, to me, that quickly, I guess, when you actually look at it, it's been over the course of 50 years, but that's only like a generation, two generations. Like, it, it can go that quickly that a, a whole, like, swath of America can just be plummeted within a couple generations' time. So for those of us who do have children and hope to have then grandchildren, it's like, at this rate, we're going to be get, like wiped out that we're not going to have kids or at least we're not going to have that nuclear family like you're specifically talking with the mom, the dad and the kids. And that's in a way that's even more detrimental to the fact that we're not even having the children to begin with. But yep, and, point. as Katie reiterated, there are currently just 23.1 million American homes, just 23.1 with those nuclear families worse since 1959. The average age of a woman at her first marriage is now 28.6 years old. Wait, can we just say the fact that it's at her first marriage? <laughs> that kind of says, just, yeah. that says a lot May, right there. Maybe if we co concentrated on keeping first marriages only marriages, yeah, you go. we then, wouldn't have then these we wouldn't problems, have the, right? It, be a In the 1950s and 60s, women typically married around 20.4 years old. That's a huge difference in average age for men to marry the first time in 2021. <laughs> men today are 30 years old before they crawl out of mom's basement. There it is. That's the other yeah. thing. 
30.4 years old, America's fertility rate dropped to 55.4 births for 1,000 in the second quarter of 21, 2021, down from 58.5 in the same period of 29. So the other thing that's alarming is the uh, in the sh very short term, this is being exacerbated by, I'm, I'm sure COVID has something to do with it, but to blame COVID for this is really, really silly because this, these, these numbers were, were before and after are pretty overwhelming. What you really have here is a long time progressive culture that sees children not as blessings, not as human beings made in the image of God, but overly expensive, overly environmentally costly, uh, complete buzz kills when it comes to your friends and social life. We have convinced young women in particular to believe that not only are children a unfortunate consequence of sex and free love. They're a complete buzzkill. What they do to your body, stretch marks, heaven forbid, and all that other stuff. And so we're just not going to buy into it anymore. I've been blessed without the stretch marks. Personal achievement of my own. It's genetics. Anyway, uh, what's alarming too, and, and think about this, how, oh, I don't know, causation, correlation, let's talk about it. Americans are also living alone at a higher rate than they used to. So more Americans are living by themselves, not socializing, at least, you know, off of this, this they'll socialize if that counts as anything, but actually getting out and talking to people and suicide numbers are going up and crime rate and just every just general distress and anxiety levels are off the charts. I don't know if it has anything to do with anything like this or maybe it has to do with this simple fact that back in 1960, 87% of adults lived with a spouse. We're at 50% now. Are you a fan of the show? Consider joining the Patriot Club. Your tax deductible donation of $99 a year keeps us going. Simply visit PatriotClub.us. That's PatriotClub.us to pledge your support and receive our signature tumbler as a token of our appreciation. We've got much more to come. Stay with us. There's no surprise in this next story based on what I was just talking about with the anxiety and, you know, social media and all that other stuff. There's no surprise that young Democrat voters are more likely to despise the other party and the other party being, you know, Republicans or whatnot, because we don't have a th three party system or anything in this nation. We have a two party system. This is out of the newest Axios poll, which found that Democrats are far more likely to dismiss people than Republicans. And the poll found that 71% of Democrats would not go on a date with someone who holds opposing views. This is why everyone does online dating now because they can weed out all the people. They don't even need to talk to you, people apparently anymore because they can be like, well, if you're uh, a Republican, clearly I'm not talking to you. If you're you know, pro-life or a Christian or any of these things, get them out of here. So. This poll found also that 37% of Democrats would not be friends with a Republican and 30% would not work for someone with a different voting history, which, I mean, we know the way the job market is going now. Anyone, we need just a breathing soul, but apparently the people on the other end who would be given all this money, if they find out that you're the boss and you have opposing views, they will not work for you. They yeah, and, and, you know, this gives the lie to the oft-repeated mantra of the left that Republicans teach their kids to hate. It's not true. We, uh, we teach our kids to disagree profoundly with statements that are society, civilization killers, like much of what the progressive agenda is, or, or actual killers like abortion and things like that, but not to hate, not to hate the people who do it. We, because we still, most of us still hold on to our Christian values, we realize that it is possible to separate the sinner from the sin. It is impossible to see sin, sin as part of what we all are and try to come after the sins and its consequences rather than to completely demean the individual. But that now is what's happening on the left. The left has become such a cult, such a quasi-religion, that there is no toleration for people who disagree. And that, they have a lot more in common with radical Islam than they do any other kind of cult religion. They will take brook, they will brook no live and let live policy. They don't agree that people are allowed to have views that differ. Uh, they don't, uh, will, they refuse to allow 
money to go to funding to religious schools to help educate as well as for public schools, as we'll see in other stories coming up this week. It is a complete our way or the highway version of Democrat politics. And whenever you see that, what I see is insecurity. You are so insecure about your own power. You're so insecure about the correctness of your own attitudes that you're going to silence everybody else than try to win debates. If you, if you have such a special project, Mr. And Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Lefty, and we know you don't, if you have such a special project in your progressivism, you ought to be able to convince us at a drop of a dime why you're so wonderfully correct, but you can't. You don't even have science on your side anymore. You used to claim the mantra, man mantra of the party of science. But with climate change and all the, the disinformation you're peddling on that, all of the broken promises and devastating lies that you said were about to happen and never did, you've given up on, on the, the moral, the scientific high ground there with all your support of transgenderism nonsense and all these other things that you are doing that are completely nonsensical. The fact that you're telling me in the face of ec economics that the best way to fight in, in inflation is to spend another $5 trillion because, tr because that's going to ma make, devalue the money even more that we have, and that's going to end inflation? I mean, even the science of economics, you violate every day. You're a sham party. You need to be condemned to the boot hill, the ash heap of history, with all other ridiculous cults. And if it helps, I'll even purchase the Kool-Aid for you. Well, then. Now I just want to drink some Kool-Aid. Um, anyway, we'll just take a look at some statistics here. Now, here's the the question about the dating thing. Would you go on a date with someone that voted for the opposing presidential candidate? Now that, I mean, when we're talking about recent elections here, we can see how this could get a little, little misconstrued by certain people. Now, 18% said, yeah, definitely, overall. 32% said probably, 32% said probably not, and 18% said definitely not. But you gotta look at how it actually broke down. Now the definitely nots, that's the, the Democrats. Again, I said 30%, three and 10, only 6% of independents and 7% of Republicans. Just look at that stat alone. And it probably explains most of why our institutions are messed up and the media and everything else. But okay, fine, you don't wanna date them, but can you at least be friendly with them? Can you be friends with someone who voted for the opposing presidential candidate? <sighs> nope. Not according to the Democrats, at least. I mean, it's good that overall it's 41%, but most of that 41% is made up of from the independents and the Republicans. Not even one in four of the Democrats would be friends. And they definitely, 10%, one in 10 definitely would not be friends with someone if you dare, dare vote for anyone, but who I say you should vote for. Those 10%? are almost exclusively educators. <laughs> they, have they don't have friends. Anyway, would you work for someone? Okay, would you work for this person? Now, I want to know in what job you just go up to your boss and say, hey, who'd you vote for? And expect them to one, tell you, and not say get back to work. But d d what are you going to do right then and there if they tell you it's the person you don't like? I I'm curious to see what they would do other than cry and well, run away. We, we, do, we do have some hints, right? Watch what's happening at Netflix, right? Good I mean, point. Good uh, point. They, they made billions of dollars off of Dave Chappelle. Much of that money went to the, the staff in terms of salary raises and, and uh, security, and they still want to fire Chappelle and punish their own bosses for doing it, right? So it shows you how suicidal this cult is as well. Yeah, and so you look at the statistics on this, the percentage breakdown, you know, the Republicans and, and even the independents, again, are somewhat logical, although the numbers probably should be higher. Uh, but the Democrats, geez, the simple fact that probably not, more than one in four, or probably not because, oh my gosh, they may have voted for someone. How does, unless you, you talk politics all day, every day, and are stuck like I am, uh, you, it shouldn't matter. It should, it should not matter at all, but this is the world we live in, and these are the hands and, we're given. Ooh, Land of confusion. It is. Do, 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 do. And, Stay a, tuned for Healthy a, Republic. An alarmingly anti-Reagan song yes. that turned out to show that in, over history, didn't age well did, for the boys, did Actually, it? it aged perfectly well, as was if addressed, you apply it. as was addressed in the concert I just saw with them. I mean, they addressed it and it feels like this is an appropriate song for today. Let's, we'll just end with that.
Today's show is sponsored by Clean Start Hand Sanitizer. For an odor-free foam hand sanitizer that lasts two hours and provides 19 refills, visit freedomproject.com slash clean. That's K-L-E-E-N to order yours today. Well, I'm just, I'm so stressed out. If only, if only I attended Eastern Illinois University where they would have allowed me to have my time to de-stress over everything that is happening. If I could have taken those two mental health days back in November, I would be a much better person. That's what's happening at the University of, or Eastern Illinois University, as they're called, where they were pampered left and right. Uh, the university back in November gave them two mental health days, but hey, you could come to all these lovely events we're hosting. They said, we recognize that mental health issues have increased on our campus and the broader community, similar to other universities across country. These issues have undoubtedly been exacerbated by the lingering pandemic, which continues to create uncertainty and stress for our students. We hear this every day from our students and concerned colleagues. We know that students are accessing critical campus services, such as the counseling center and medical clinic that support student wellness. <laughs> Every time you go to the Student Wellness Center, they say you have an STD. Fact check, true. Additionally, and that's not just coming from me, by the way. Anyway, additionally, we have received feedback from faculty, academic advisors, resident assistants, and tutors that the everyday challenges of navigating higher education are especially difficult this year for everyone. We hope our students will use these two days designed to help de-stress and to prepare their minds and bodies to finish the academic semester strong. Please know that EIU, as a community is all in for you for your mental health and well-being and committed to the success of every learner wow that alone makes you think oh sweet we get two days off but hey if you just if you read that statement you got to scroll on down to what the two days of activities are so i guess there were several days but my favorite was the second day of things and and one of the things that they had was the self-care open house from 11.30 to 2, which included, as you can see, therapy dogs, meditation space, chair yoga, beginner yoga, stretching, sleep hygiene, lavender, what? It's just probably a bunch of essential oils, I guess, on that one. Resiliency, the stress balls. <laughs> yeah, that's about resiliency right there. We're gonna give you stress balls. Literally, it says stress balls. I go back to what you said before. The verb you kept using was pampering. Pampering. And I think that's perfect, but not in the pampering. way, not in the way we usually word. When oh, we pamper somebody, we spoil them. And yeah, that's happening here. I want to use the word pampering as if putting pampers on them. What you are doing is not coddling them. It's worse. You're treating them like little babies. Put your pampers on these little kids because they're bedwetting liberals. Everything stresses them out. They're whiny. I see it at college all the time. The reasons they can't come to class are stunning. I woke up and I was insecure. I woke up with a feeling in the pit of my stomach that things weren't well. Therefore, I can't come to class today. It is unbelievable. The only pampering that's happening on these college kids is they're being strapped down and their little nasty bottoms are being, I don't know where I'm going with this. The only, yes. real, mm. the only real pampering going on on these schools is the type where adults are wearing baby diapers. I'm pretty impressed that you know Pampers, Pampers as a diaper brand, which is, that's pretty high quality there, the Pampers is. But uh, I want to talk about something else Joe Biden would approve. My favorite of favorite events that they had during this thing was the Ice Cream for Ice Cream ah. event uh, from 2.30 to 4. So after you got done with your stress balls, but basically. What about the last time, the lactose, the, what about the lactose intolerant? Well. They've been ignored. I'm sure that, they go back to that all list. Let's, let's, I, I challenge you. Let's come up with one politically correct objection for each of these real quick. Therapy dogs. I'm a Muslim. Meditation space. Why do we have to meditate in outer space? Why can't we have it here on earth? Chair yoga. Yoga's a religious Indian, right? It's white people shouldn't be doing. Beginning yoga. What makes you say who's a beginning? We shouldn't we get rid of uh, beginning late and media? It's not fair. Stretching. 
Able-bodied. Able, but the, yeah. the able-bodied, right? Fine. Sleep hygiene, <laughs> right? What if I, are you implying that when I sleep, I'm unhygienic and lavender is your, what if I'm allergic to a lavender? Stress balls, stress balls, resiliency, right? Why balls? Why can't we have ovaries? How about stress ovaries? Spa on the go kits. Classist and elitist. Mm -hmm. When you hear the word spa, you think about the economically abled. Affirmation cards, pl cardboard. You're killing the planet with cutting down trees. Journaling more trees. Anyway, just because if that list wasn't insane at the ice cream for event, because you can't just have ice cream, you also have to have their games, Lego, and relaxation over a tasty bowl of coldness. Learn a bit about their honors program, blah, or just come to eat and play. In other words, the babies back to Pampers again. Because when you eat and play, what you get, what results is a diaper full. And that stuff is one great big college diaper full of stupidity. It's time we're doing Christmas in the air themes here between now and the, the holiest of holidays. And we're going to talk about a Christmas carol because when you think about Christmas and you think about art and literature, you think about Christmas carol. And again, I wanna give the, the man his due. This is a Christmas carol by uh, Charles Dickens, a subtitle that people don't usually know. It's oftentimes referred to as being a ghost story of Christmas. This is a novella, a short novel. You can read it to your kids on Christmas Eve, and I hope you will consider it. Uh, it is a novella by Dickens. It's first published in 1843, and it is illustrated by the very interesting drawings of John Leach. A Christmas Carol recounts the story of Ebenezer Scrooge, the elderly miser who is visited by the ghost of his former business partner, Jacob Marley, and the three spirits of past, present, and yet to come. After their visit, Scrooge is transformed into a kinder, gentler, more Christian man. Dickens wrote A Christmas Carol during a period when the the British were exploring and reevaluating past Christmas traditions, what to keep and what to change, including carols and newer customs, such as Christmas cards and Christmas trees. He was influenced by the experiences of his own youth and by the Christmas stories of other authors, including Washington Irving and Douglas Gerald. Dickens had written three Christmas stories prior to A Christmas Story, to uh, the Christmas Carol. Published on 19th of December, just six days before the holiday, the first edition sold out by Christmas Eve. By the end of 1844, a year later, 13 editions had already been released. He went on to write four more Christmas stories in subsequent years. In 1849, Dickens met, went on a worldwide speaking tour in which he ran, read the story, which proved so successful that he undertook 127 further performances all the way until 1870 and his death. And the, the quote that I wanna tease you with today is an important one. This is when Jacob Marley, his longtime partner and an equally Scroogeish character shows up on Christmas Eve to warn his former partner that the goats will visit him. And of course, Scrooge denies it. At one point, Scrooge says, you're just a bit of undigested potato. You are not real. You are uh, a bad dream for something I ate. And, and the business of, of what was our business? You, at one point, Scrooge says to Marley, but you were always such a good businessman, Jacob. Why are you here now? And then you get this business, cried the ghost, wringing its hands again. Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. Yes, indeed. All right, before we go, let's show some love to our Patriot Club members. And today, it's a shout out going to Alan from Kent, Washington. Alan, thank you for supporting us. And that wraps up this show for Freedom Project. I'm Katie. He's Dr. Duke. Fa la 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 la.